Are you kidding me? That's awesome. Sweet. Hello world, Greg Strike here, and welcome back to The Curious Place. I'm glad you're here. In this video, we're going to continue the build of our circuit to give our home-built 6502 computer the ability to read data off standard audio cassettes utilizing the Kansas City standard. At the end of this video, our home-built 6502 will be able to load and display data directly from the circuit we built in the last few videos. Well, if you haven't watched the previous videos yet, that's probably okay, because in this video, we're going to be covering the theory on how to connect this circuit up to the 6502, and that's useful for many other types of circuits. But if you're at all interested in how we're actually decoding this audio, I highly recommend you go back and watch the previous videos. Now, in just a moment, we'll be continuing our project by adding some wiring and modifying some code. The code that we'll be modifying is from where Ben left off in his video number 12, simply named Interrupt Handling. So if you've been following along with his videos, that's where we are. But if you haven't been following along, I highly recommend you head out to Casey Dunn's uh, GitHub repositories. He has a 6502 repo out there where he has posted all the code from Ben's videos. So it'll make it real easy for you to get caught up. I'll make sure to post a link in the description. Let's get into it. So here we have our Kansas City standard decoder and it's pretty much unchanged as it was from our last video. The only changes I've made here are changing out the parity LED with a green LED. I've also added this capacitor here to help keep power levels nice and smooth. So now we're going to start our work at connecting this to Ben's 6502 kit. I've built and coded the 6502 all the way up to Ben's video number 12 where it's counting interrupts on the 6522CA1 pin. To make things a bit easier for future projects, I'm going to be adding these power rails which will become our data bus. This should give us a nice convenient way to continue adding features to the 6502 in future projects. I may add other control lines to this like the read and write line and maybe the upper and lower address lines, but we'll figure that out going forward. So to connect the data bus, I'm just going to tap off the data lines coming off the RAM chip here and then I'm going to bring those over to the rails. The pins on the RAM chip are 19 through 10, skipping 14 of course, which is ground. So let's get those connected. The data bus will be organized D7 through D0, left to right, which will help us humans keep things straight. So when I get everything connected, the data bus will be laid out like this. As we add features to the computer, we'll be able to simply tap into these instead of forcing wires onto the breadboard, where things are already starting to get pretty cramped. So before making any more changes, I always like to perform a sanity check to make sure we're getting what we expect before going forward. So I've connected the Arduino to the data bus here, and I'm going to connect the clock module so that we can step through the boot cycle. After I reset the 6502 and I give it a few pulses, we should see a 00 and an 80 show up on the data bus, which is our reset vector. Um, Uh, I'll bet you I have these Arduino lines swapped around again. So, so much for us humans being able to keep them straight, huh? Uh, let me get these switched around uh, real quick here. Uh, no, uh, I'll, I'll be right back. Oh, hey, welcome back. I, uh, I, I got that figured out. It was a, uh, a real difficult issue that probably would have taken even seasoned professionals uh, months to resolve. So anyway, now, now that we're able to see the data on the data bus, I'd like us to simplify the interrupt counter a bit to make things a bit more readable and to speed up the interrupt processing. First, I'm going to change this to a binary number as opposed to a hex. It's not really changing any functionality here. It's actually the same number. I just find this a bit easier to read when troubleshooting. And these lines here are where we're setting the interrupt enable register of the 6522. It's actually enabling CA1 as an interrupt pin for port A. So I'm also going to do the same thing for the PCR, the peripheral control register, which is just all zeros. Again, it's the same number, it's just easier for me to read. This line here is setting the 6522 to use a negative edge for all interrupts. But really, in this case, only CA1, since that's all we really have enabled in the line above. So anytime the 6522 sees a transition from a high to a low, it'll cause uh, the interrupt line on the CPU to go low. 
Now let's check out the IRQ handler in the code. This is where the CPU goes anytime it receives an interrupt request, well, as soon as it finishes up whatever instruction it's currently working on. Currently, this will only be caused by the CA1 pin receiving a low pulse. The first thing I'd like to do is move the bit port A to the top of the IRQ function. This line actually clears the interrupt on the 6522, basically telling the 6522 that the IRQ has been handled. The 6522 will then bring the IRQ line that goes to the CPU back up to high. Clearing the IRQ is important. If we return from the IRQ function without clearing the IRQ, the CPU will see that this line is still low, and as soon as it leaves, it will actually send us right back into the IRQ function. The reason I'm moving this to the top is because I want the IRQ cleared as fast as possible. The reason for this is that some versions of the 6522 have what's called an open drain IRQ output. As soon as the IRQ is cleared, the IRQ line that goes to the CPU actually takes a little bit of time to go high again. And if we return from the IRQ function, and the 6522 hasn't yet completely finished its transition from low to high, there's a chance that we'll be thrown right back into the IRQ function, and this would definitely mess up our count. The W65C22 that ends with an S doesn't have an open drain IRQ, so it doesn't really suffer from this. This is the one that's included in Ben's kit. But doing this does allow us to clear the IRQ quicker, and it makes it more compatible with other versions of the 6522. I'll leave a link to wilsonminescompany.com in the description below, where this uh, issue is actually described in a bit more detail. Now in the interest of speed, I'm going to be removing these lines here that preserves the state of our registers on the stack when we enter the IRQ. For what we're doing right now, we're not going to be modifying the registers, but we may need to re-add these at a later time if we decide to use them. I just want this to process as fast as possible. That said, delay doesn't sound very good either, so let's get rid of this too. And then the pieces here, these are the ones that restore the registers, so let's get rid of that. Cool. So now there's actually one more change I'm going to make. Uh, I want to comment out these commands here. Uh, these commands actually temporarily disable and re-enable IRQ from the CPU perspective, and these are here to ensure that the counter variable doesn't change from an interrupt as we're doing math on it below. Uh, we could probably leave these in, but for now, I'm just going to remove them. Okay, so let's assemble and write this to the EEPROM. One second, just got to unplug it and plug it back in. I've been having some issues with this old power uh, USB hub. There we go. All right, let's see what we got. Okay, here's our SR latch from the last video. For testing, I've connected a jumper to the output of the SR latch here. If you remember from our last video, this output is used to control whether or not the Kansas City standard clock is running. It goes high as the circuit is decoding a byte, and then as soon as the byte is demodulated and ready, this output goes low, which also stops the Kansas City standard clock. We're going to use this high to low signal to create an interrupt, telling the computer that a byte is ready to be read from the circuit. So I've run that signal over here to the breadboard, and I've connected the oscilloscope here for monitoring as well, and then finally brought it over here to the CA1 pin on the 6522. When the signal from the KCS circuit goes low, it triggers the interrupt on the 6522, and the 6522 sets the interrupt line on the 6502 to low. Cool, so that's what I have so far. So now we're going to send a 20-byte KCS audio file to the circuit, loop it, and we should get 20 counts added every single time that the wave file plays again. And we should see this on the LCD screen as it triggers the interrupt code. So let's reset the 6502, and let's loop our wave file. As you can see here, uh, we kind of have a problem. The first one gets counted just fine, but as it continues, if you look closely, sometimes it's missing a count here and there, as it's no longer multiples of 20s. This is not good, so let's take a look at the oscilloscope for clues. Okay, so the yellow is the serial line, the red is the system clock. Yes, I know it says KCS ready. I'm not sorry about it. I'm just going to put this here and let's move on. And the blue is the 6502 interrupt line. I've set the oscilloscope to trigger off the 6502 interrupt line going low and then I've zoomed this in. From this view, the serial line will always appear to be high and those 1 MHz clock pulses are looking a bit bigger. Looking at the 6502 interrupt line, you'll see that the line goes high at the right. When it goes high, this represents when the CPU has ran the bit port A instruction and has cleared the interrupt. 
On average, you'll notice that the interrupt takes about 13 microseconds for the processor to clear the interrupt. But if you keep an eye on the 6502 interrupt line, you'll notice some strange activity. Sometimes the interrupt is getting cleared much quicker. This is a pretty big clue into the issue, and it took me a long time to figure out what was going on here and why we were missing counts. And this issue, right here, caused this video being delayed by weeks. And with holidays and work and family stuff, I didn't have a lot of time to dedicate to resolving it, though it was always on my mind. The problem is, is that it's not a valid test, at least not the way that I'm running it. If you remember correctly, an interrupt is cleared when the port that caused the interrupt is either read or written to. And we don't know exactly when an interrupt will come in, but it's very likely that the processor will be in the middle of another instruction. The processor will finish up that instruction, and then it'll send us on to our interrupt handler once it's done. So if that instruction just happens to be one that either reads or writes to the port, the interrupt will essentially be canceled, never sending us to our function. And we're constantly reading and writing to this port, since it just happens to be the same port as our LCD display. So my theory is, is that we're canceling our interrupt before it even runs. This is why we see really short interrupt signals here on the oscilloscope. To validate this theory, I'm going to close my eyes, cross my fingers, and just continue the build by adding an additional via to see if it gets rid of this conflict. Here's hoping. So here's the new 6522 versatile interface adapter, and it's the same chip that came in Ben's 6502 kit right here. So let's connect this up. First we'll add our ground and our power, and then we'll bring the output of the KCS circuit down to the 6522 port B pins. Next we'll connect the data pins to the new data bus, and I'll bring the system clock all the way over from the other via using this white line. And I'll do the same for the read and write line using this yellow wire. Okay, so now that we're going to have multiple vias and we want either of them to be able to trigger an interrupt, we'll actually need to add another chip. And for that, we're going to use this AND gate. It's a 74HC08. This chip actually has four AND gates on it, and each of them has two inputs. I'm going to daisy chain the four AND gates together, and then I'm going to bring the interrupt line from our existing 6522 via to one of the inputs. And then I'm going to do the same for our new 6522. I'll tie any unused inputs to high, and then I'll bring the output of all this to the interrupt pin of the 6502. Now, when no interrupt is present, all inputs will be high, and the output of this chip will be high. But if any of these inputs go low, it'll cause the output to go low, which will generate an interrupt on the 6502. The nice thing is, is we can also use this AND gate for any additional 6522 vias that we want to add in the future. So that'll be cool. So now we're going to connect the chip select lines, also known as the addressing lines. These are the lines that the CPU controls to tell the 6522 when the CPU is trying to access it. The new 6522 will be connected pretty much the same way as the other 6522, with one small difference. The two CS2 lines of the 6522s will be connected together, and this will handle the two leftmost bits of the addressing. And then the differences will connect the CS1 line to A12 instead of A13, and this actually moves the new 6522 to address space 5000 to 5FFF. Let me show you what that looks like when we look at the memory map. You can see here that the leftmost bits of both vias are 0 and 1. This is why we've connected the CS2 lines together. Then, the way we differentiate between them is the next bit in the address. For via 1, we're using A13. That puts it in the 6000 to 7 FFF address space. For via 2, we're going to use the A12 line, which will put it at address 5000 to 5 FFF. So we'll connect CS1 to address line A12, which will activate the new 6522 when the leftmost bits are 0 and 1, and A12 is a 1. Cool. So that part should be set. Let's do another sanity check and just make sure that she doesn't blow up when I power it up. Cool. Before I forget, let's also connect up the reset line to make sure the new 6522 gets reset along with the rest of the computer. And to wrap up the rest of the hardware changes, we need to connect up the four rightmost bits of the address lines. These are the lines that activate the specific control registers on the 6522. Since these will also be the same as the other 6522 via, I'll just tap into those from the other via. There's a little more room over there on that part of the breadboard. 
Okay, so with that, we'll do another sanity check and make sure there's no magic smoke. And I think we're ready to do some coding to see if my theory is correct about why we were missing interrupt counts. So as we look at our code, nothing really changes for the existing 6522. I've tried to keep my changes backwards compatible to the original design. However, I do want to update the variable names we're using since we're going to have more than one via now. So I'll do a find and replace on the current variable names to make sure that they reflect via one. Okay, just a quick look. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Looks good. And let's do a sanity check. All right, still assembles. So now let's get our new VIA's addressing set up. I'll copy VIA1, update the name to reflect VIA2, and then I'll set the new address locations. We'll then go down here to where we set up the interrupts for the VIA's, and since we're going to be using VIA2 now, we'll just change that here. Okay, cool, one last change. Let's head down to the interrupt handler to make sure that we're using VIA2 there now as well. Okay, I think that's it. Let's see if it assembles. Yep, and write it to ROM. Uh, what well, I, yeah, I forgot to latch down the chip in the programmer. Let's try now. That looks better. Okay, let's put it in and see what we get. We didn't change the code to use port B IRQ yet, so I'm actually connecting the output of the KCS circuit to pin 40, which is CA1, the IRQ for port A. All right, let's power it up and do a reset. <sighs> Again. Well, it turns out that I just mistyped the addresses for VIA2. We were supposed to start them with 5,000, not 4,000. So let's make those changes. We'll assemble, write to EEPROM, and we'll try again. All right, the big test. I'm going to plug it back in here. We'll reset. And there we go. Sweet, that looks much better. I actually let this run overnight, and we didn't miss a single IRQ. Finally. I cannot believe how long it took me to get to this point, and I am super thrilled in such a nerdy way that I am counting by 20s with the rise and fall of a signal. This is, this is great. So let's, uh, let's move on to the next part. Well, with that working, let's get the KCS circuit plugged into the correct pin on the 6522. We're actually going to plug this into pin 18, which is pin CB1, which is one of the control lines for port B. Port B is where we have the KCS decoded data connected to. Now that we have the hardware side ready, let's get the new interrupt configured. The first thing we'll do is copy the existing config, and then we'll set this code here to make sure it's configuring via 1. This down here will be for the new via, via number 2. So for VIA1, we're no longer going to be using the interrupts. So we're going to disable all of them here at the interrupt enable register. According to the data sheet on the right, we can do this by setting the leftmost bit to zero and applying ones to the rest of the bits. Now for VIA2, our KCS VIA, we want to enable interrupts for port B on CB1 where we have the SR latch plugged in. We can do this by setting the interrupt enable register's leftmost bit to 1, and then the fourth bit also to a 1, and then we'll leave the rest at zeros. In the peripheral control register, we'll leave it configured this way, which is basically just setting all the port control lines to use negative edge interrupt detection. Remember, the SR latch in our KCS circuit goes from high to low as soon as the byte has been fully demodulated, so this is what we want. Now we need to configure the data direction register on port B. Currently we have all pins set as output, but we're sending data to this port, so we need to change this setting by setting it all to zeros, meaning that they're now inputs. While we're at it, we might as well just set port A to be all outputs. Not that we're using port A, I just want them the same. Then I'll just add this comment here so I don't forget. And then we'll change our IRQ handler to now reflect port B. Okay, that's a lot of changes, so let's do another sanity check. We'll assemble and write to the EEPROM. All right, let's put this back in here and test, and cool, still working. 
Okay, after all these months, we're finally ready to pull data from the circuit. The first thing I'd like to do is simplify the code a bit more by removing all the code that we have here for converting this to a decimal. We're not going to use it going forward. Also, for now, let's just get rid of the counter stuff. Then back down here in the IRQ handler, let's comment out the counter stuff here too. Back at the top of our loop, we have these two lines that are setting the cursor on the LCD to home every loop. Let's do that, but let's only do it once right before we enter our loop. Let's also get rid of these two lines here, which are setting the message variable to zero. We're not going to use it. And then, let's just create an infinite loop here. As soon as the CPU gets to this part of the code, it'll loop here between lines 70 and 71 for all of eternity, at least until we get an interrupt. Now for the meat. Let's go back down to our interrupt handler. Instead of using the bit instruction to clear port B, let's actually load whatever is on port B to the accumulator using the load A instruction. Doing this also clears the interrupt since we're reading from the 6522 port. Then we'll store it to memory at the message variable location using store A. For now, you should actually be able to leave this line out as the message variable isn't being used anywhere else yet. And next, we'll jump up to our print char function. The print char function will print whatever's on the A register to the LCD screen. Currently, this contains what we just read from our Kansas City Standard Circuit. Okay, let's assemble and write. And now what? Uh, one second. I found the problem. It looks like I've been a little too hard on the pins here. I've already ordered some new chips, but let's just see if we can fix this thing to keep going. Well, that looks better. So now I'm going to create a text file that will hopefully be displayed on our LCD screen. Now, the LCD that we're using is a 16 character by 2 rows LCD display. According to the datasheet, there are these areas of the memory that are not consecutive. What this means is that there are holes in the memory map when compared to what we actually see on our display. What this means for us is if we try to write to these areas, it won't show up on the display. So rather than code around this, what I'm going to do is try to keep it simple and just fill in these reserved areas with spaces in our text file. So when we get to that area of the screen, we're just going to be filling up with spaces, and we really could choose anything, because it's not going to be displayed. So for each column I write, I'll use 16 characters, which will be displayed, and then I'll just hit the space bar until we're in the 40th column, like this. And I'll do that for each line, which should fill up that uh, extra space that we can't see. Okay, so let's save that. We'll drop the terminal and convert that to a Kansas City Standard WAV file using the PyKCS Python script, which you can find on my GitHub. We'll run it by using Python, giving it the script name, the file we want to convert, and then the name of the file that we want it to output. All right, looks good. Let's loop that in Audacity, and we can do that by holding Shift and then clicking Play. All right, let's pull our chip, and we'll put it in. Power it up. Do a reset on this. And it's working. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I love that. Uh, yeah, and it should uh, it should keep doing this for forever. It's just looping uh, on in Audacity. Thank you so much for watching, guys. In the next video, we're going to continue our project by modifying the code and turning it into a bootloader. What that means is our computer is not only just going to have the ability to display data from tape, but we'll also be able to load a program directly from tape. So that's going to be awesome. If that's something you think you might want to see, please feel free to subscribe. If you guys are enjoying these videos and you'd like to help ensure that I can continue making more, please consider swinging by my Patreon. Of course, there is no obligation. These videos are free after all, but it is the best way to help support the channel. And with that, I will bid you guys a farewell. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Bye for now.